Did you guys enjoy the film? Oh. Half of the reason it is what it is is sitting at my left here. Rachel Grady. Whose partner, uh, hi, with her partner Heidi Ewing. She's, this is the other half here. She's invisible. Uh, I had absolutely nothing to do with the creation of this film except to have lived the life. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't be prouder of it. I just have to say that. And thank Rachel and Heidi. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? You know, I'm, I'm so, t before you sit down. <laughs> uh, this is the fourth uh, Q&A we've done. This weekend, yeah. Uh, and the audience, is I after every one, is very quiet and thoughtful. I, I, I th I'm, I'm reading into it, thoughtful. Am I right about that? Yes. That you were touched and it's not the easiest thing in the world to start talking immediately maybe we should have let you talk among yourselves first <laughs> uh, but I'm very touched by the fact that I see and feel you guys are are touched and that makes me want to just you know tell them again and again and again what a great great job they did I'm Adam, also, no. I'm going to chalk it up to, this is New, York, New Yorkers too. <laughs> New Yorkers are. Uh, I'm sure there have been movies and certainly uh, performances and direction. And my, uh, you know, I fell in love with... Uh, with in radio, with voices and performances and so forth, before there was much television. And I went uh, to, uh, I was taken to a play, I don't even remember the name of the play because I didn't like it, but I loved the majesty of live performance. And uh, so when I was a kid living in Hartford, uh, I was allowed on a Saturday to go into New York and uh, see a play, a Saturday matinee, and come back uh, to Hartford. And uh, I saw a lot of theater. And the magic and, you know, uh, of live performance. And that's why everything I've ever done was done in front of a live audience. No laugh tracks, those were people laughing. Yeah, I, uh, that was one of the reasons that we had this motif of the theater is because you really, if you start looking through um, a cer certain lenses of looking at Norman's work, his 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 television shows are very much kind of three three acts. They feel very theatrical, and um, everything usually takes place in the same location. Sometimes there's this location or that location, but they really do feel more from the theater than they do from cinema. Ma'am. I think television and uh, uh, in all its forms has look at the LGBT movement. Was that not helped by where we are right now? Uh, what? You know, our government just did about transsexual. Who would have guessed 10 years ago that that, or 15 or 20 years ago, that could have happened? But I think uh, the media is totally responsible for the, how quickly all of that came about. If only we could deal with our racial problems so quickly. Uh, sir. Two, no. two questions. Is uh, political correctness a problem today? And um, is Archie Bunker a Donald Trump <laughs> doppelganger? No. Uh, Archie Bunker was a real human being. Donald Trump, I don't know what he is. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless, uh, here's the way I've thought of him. He is the middle finger of the American right hand. <laughs> 
he is saying, look at leadership everywhere in this country today, it's disastrous. And he, the American people, I can't believe they're serious about him. Not that they wouldn't elect him, but they could be doing that too as a, it's a way of saying, this is the kind of leadership you give us, screw you. Uh, what about political correctness? Do you feel like it's helped us, or what's? Yeah, I, I, I don't even like the words, <laughs> political correctness. The American people, don't, they, you know, there was a fellow by the name of H.L. Mencken, who was a writer a great many years ago, who said, nobody ever lost money underestimating the intelligence of the American people. And uh, it w it's true that we are not the best, we're not as educated as we should be. Our government <laughs> has failed, uh, if it takes government, and I think it does. Uh, we are 17, I think, on the list of Western countries in terms of how well educated our people are. But we're wise of heart. and. Uh, and I don't believe that H.L. Uh, Mencken was anywhere near correct. I don't believe, I didn't believe at the time we started with All in the Family, that when they said there are two things, that, there were two ways they put it. One way was this won't fly in Des Moines. And the other way was you can't do this because there'll be a knee-jerk reaction in the Bible. Uh, in, there'll be knee-jerk in the middle of the country and in the Bible Belt. That was a phrase they use all the time. I made a film before I did All in the Family in Des Moines. I spent three months there. I felt I came from Des Moines. So I was able to say, bullshit. Uh, I know d I'm, I'm from Des Moines, don't tell me. Uh, but it was, again, just the establishment underestimating the American people. Anyone else? Sir? Homework. He did his homework. This guy's awesome. <laughs> there was, uh, I, I, I did come back. It was, you know, easy to fly back to, uh, to New York. And uh, did it all the time. But I also, there was a Marion Doherty in New York who was a great casting, <laughs> great casting woman. And between them and Jane Murray and, uh, uh, I, 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 was, I was very informed by them and they were very much a part of the casting experience. We didn't, uh, unfortunately, I feel like we didn't totally flesh out this, that concept in the film because we couldn't do everything. But um, I really believe that was, that's one of Norman's superpowers is, is casting, is seeing someone, you know, giving them a role and then they just take it on and create something above and beyond that. But he knows that they somehow will have a relationship with each other. And you see that with all of his main characters. They just took, took what he thought of and took it to another level. And they were all from the theater. Can you, well, sorry, to, so part two. Can you talk a little bit about the spin-offs? Didn't you ask a question? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa? <laughs> the question was, what do you think television lacks and needs today? If I uh, looked at as much as I should to answer that question, I might think it needs nothing. Because there's so much glorious work being done on television today. But unfortunately, there are three, four hundred, uh, you know, uh, sites. I don't know how to watch everything that's terrific. Nor do I have the time in this life to do it. It might be something I just discovered like five days ago. <laughs> Which is, by the way, typical Norman. If you had asked him a month ago, it would have been the one he found a month ago. Louis C.K. has a new show. Uh, and it's on, a, it's on his network or, how, or Signal or how the hell you do it, he's, I don't he's know. He's a genius. He is a genius. It's called The Horace and Pete. And it stars Alan Alda oh. and, st and him, Louis, and... Uh, and Steve Buscemi, and it is, 
I see a couple here looking at each other and talking about it. Do you know it? Do you, have you seen it? Are you going to look for it? You will love me for this. <laughs> it's, it's so good. No, it's, it's you, you go and you buy it. You buy it. Is that how it is? Yeah, you buy it episode by episode. I think it's like $5 an episode. It's on his website. It's, it, he so did it is it, his own channel. It, it's his website. And it's fabulous. It's just fabulous. It was very successful in England, but it was, I think they did six shows a year for three years, about 18 shows altogether. In America, where stress is our b favorite product, I mean not stress, excess, uh, ex everything in excess, we had to do 26 the very first time. The guy in red is very patient, right there. Yeah, hi, uh, I'd like to know, you know, it seemed to me that, um, you know, you were d more directing in, the, in those meetings, um, and I was wondering how you worked with the directors. How much was it you, and how much was it the directors on those shows? I'll put it this way within a little anecdote. There may be five times a year a total stranger all through the years has come up to me at an airport or some on the street or someplace and said, uh, you're Mr. Lear? I said, yes. Uh, a sock and a shoe, a sock and a shoe. Yeah. <laughs> now I hear people relating to that. A sock and a shoe, a sock and a shoe. A scene and all in the family where they're getting, they had been <coughs> asleep in the same room that night, Archie and Mike, and the next morning, Archie sees Mike put on a sock and a shoe. <laughs> and he thinks it should have been a sock and a sock and then the shoes. <laughs> And it's one of the great routines in television history. And I walked into a run-through on the fourth day of rehearsal and saw that it was never in the script. The director and the actors came up with it. So that gift occurred again and again and again and again. It was a giant collaboration and everybody was a part of it. How many people remember Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman? Oh, I love that. <laughs> Shouldn't that be on the air now? Yeah. With all the television, somebody, that, uh, there has to be a corner of one of these networks uh, where Mary Hartman could run because it would be every bit as effective today as it was then. Because nothing has changed where Mary Hartman is concerned. What I loved most about Mary Hartman, it was it followed the same line, whatever episode we were doing, we told the thousand stories. But the central idea of Mary Hartman was, well, how is the media affecting a simple housewife in Fern Fernwood, Ohio? So on the very first show, She's standing, <coughs> as you saw here, with a can of, uh, <laughs> of floor wax. And uh, she sees a, a waxy yellow buildup, but, the, but the, the, the can says it can't be. <laughs> <laughs> she, these people have been in business for a lot. They, can't, they wouldn't lie about this. <laughs> she is totally convinced the can is right and her eyes are wrong. <laughs> In the very last, uh, toward the very end of the, uh, uh, the series, this was a show that was on five nights a week, for those of you who don't know. And uh, like a soap opera. Which is insane. <laughs> it is insane. It was, it was very hard. And, uh, but on the ne it, it, toward the end of the show, she's on the David Susskind show, which was one of the favorite talk shows at that time being uh, interviewed by three talking heads that are driving her out of her mind, and they succeed in driving her insane. She goes nuts on the David Susskind show. She's committed within a couple of shows, and one of the last shows of Mary Hartman, she's in this institution. She's surrounded by people who look as fractured and, and, and uh, disturbed as she is and she's sitting watching a television set and then somebody comes along and is working on it. The person leaves and she says to a nurse, did, 
what I think happened really happened? And the nurse says, yes, Mary. And she says, R really? It, that, that, and the nurse says, Mary, yes. And Mary says, I cannot believe that I, I love this, <laughs> I, that I, Mary Hartman, am finally, and the camera is coming in close, and all of the kooks are coming around, <laughs> and they're all, they make a wonderful tableau as she says, that I, Mary Hartman, am finally a member of a Nielsen family. <laughs> Fade out. <laughs> Two more questions. Fabulous. I wanted uh, all, the, all the glitters was again, uh, like Mary Hartman, five nights a week. Uh, it wasn't as well known because I don't think, well, it, I think we did a wonderful job, but we moved too quickly uh, with it. We came up with, it was too big an idea that, that needed to be laid out smor far more slowly. Uh, all that glitters, uh, you know, from the expression, all that glitters does not shine. This, uh, we reversed Genesis, and Adam was made by the, from the rib of Eve. So everything was turned around. The women were very much women. They dressed as women. They, were, they didn't try to change their voices or anything. The men were men. Nothing was changed there, except that the women controlled everything. They had all the jobs, they ran the companies, they ran the s country, they, and the men were the domestic creatures who took care of the children. The women birthed the children. We didn't change the biology. We just changed uh, Genesis. <laughs> and uh, it was, it, I, mean, I, adored, I adored the show. But this is what I mean when we move too fast to, you know, in the opening uh, of the show, the, the, you saw four women in their domestic uh, uh, situations with their house husbands, and then they went to work. When we cut to work, they were in a giant uh, uh, a publicity firm, uh, a, uh, and, and one of the accounts was the uh, Marlboro cigarette was a big deal then. So we did, I can't remember what we called it then, and if you remember, you, I'm sure you remember the Marlboro Man. Well, we had the tumbleweed woman. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't believe, if you do remember, the, one of the most beautiful women that ever, you know, worked on television, Linda Gray from Dallas. She, this was pre-Dallas, and she played uh, the uh, tumbleweed man, <laughs> woman. So she was a transsexual, and she was the most beautiful guy you ever saw. <laughs> and it was fabulous. But it came out of the desire to just examine uh, the relationship for, between men and women if everything was reversed. Last question. Are there any the uh, are there any issues that we dealt with on all on the Jefferson good times and the Jeffersons yes. uh, that we would do differently today? Uh, you know, I know what makes what, what what the question comes out of that moment with uh, with uh, with Florida, uh, but I'm really trying to. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, uh, everything I did, I based on what I knew at the time uh, and felt and understood and believed. And uh, I don't know in that arena if anything has changed. Uh, I love those shows. Uh, I think with where JJ was concerned, we, you know, this is again the problem with excess in everything I think we deal with. We, we could have been on 13 weeks and, 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 and eight years longer. Or uh, we could have held 
this young actor down. Uh, he got he got a great laugh, great reaction from live people, so, you know, saying dynamite, and uh, and he would do it often, and we allowed it, and maybe we were wrong to have allowed it so much, but uh, uh, you know what? What I've not told an audience, and it has nothing to do with the que the answer to your question, but w w there was an evening honoring me recently. And uh, and Jimmy Walker was there at our table. You know who his date was? Jimmy Walker. No, shh, you don't say. Oh, no. <laughs> Do you know who his date was? Anybody know who Jimmy Walker has been dating for eight years? Now, I'm going to tell you who. <laughs> and anybody who knows the who that I'm mentioning is going to say, What? Somebody may think you lying, son of a bitch. <laughs> Jimmy Walker dates Ann Coulter. <laughs> what? <laughs> we sat together for an entire evening. But I knew this before this evening. I never thought I'd see it. <laughs> but uh, I, I love Jimmy Walker, I loved the character. When we started, he was a painter. Oh, this is very telling in regard to your question. When we started, he was a painter. One of the best episodes we did was he drew a black Jesus. He painted a black Jesus. And it was a great episode. It was a talent that older actors on the show wished to deny him. And we didn't carry through the series with Jimmy, with JJ as a painter. We have another Q&A, which is why I have to cut this off. But thank you so much for coming. Tell thank other you. people to come. Tell other people to come.